So we've just got uh, some function practice, some breakouts and code alongs to go through today together. Um, quick reminder, for those working on the take home technical Python problems for uh, admissions, know that we cannot help you with the, uh, the Python or the coding uh, parts of these problems. Um, in certain cases, I've been willing to work with people after on these after they've solved them. Um, so yeah, for obvious reasons, we can't weigh in on that. Cool. So go ahead. We've we've got sort of a code along format today. Let me get increase this text size a little bit here. Uh, let me know. I, I have my text size turned down a little bit. I prefer it at this size, but uh, if it's too small for anybody, just let me know and I'll I'll uh, zoom in. Um, one second. Let me just adjust the size a little bit. Squeeze that in. Okay, cool. So here's our first breakout. So get your uh, uh, replets running and ready to go and ready to code along. So write a function called percentile 50. And I'm going to, um, I could paste this in, but there's a link to the slides where you can just copy this. And I'm, I'm just gonna copy it into my, uh, editor here, just so I can have it in one place. I just like to have a doc string on site. I don't know why, maybe, it, maybe it's just a personal thing, I don't know. All right, uh, so write a function called percentile 50. Done. Okay, uh, it takes a list of arbitrary numbers takes a list of arbitrary numbers, the function will return a dictionary. We'll return a dictionary where the keys are strings. Oops. Totally just didn't copy all that. That's what happened. Where are the keys? And then I like to do this when I'm talking about a dictionary, I have a line. Keys are da da da, and the values are blah blah blah. Okay, so where the keys are strings that describe the upper and lower fiftieth percentile. Okay, as a range, see below. They're going to give us this for examples. Okay. So uh, given this is our input should return this particular dictionary. Great, well, that makes testing simple because now I can just say uh, my list equals this and I have a clear expectation set. Um, I'm looking at these keys and these aren't gonna change. I can basically just tell what these are. So I might as well just bake these in now That's gonna be fine in this case. We'll make the values, so I notice the values are lists. So we'll just make them lists to start off with. And then I gotta change this one to greater than. Um, and let's complete this test here. Whoops. Great. So, um, Hopefully it's clear kind of what I'm doing. Every time I get a bit of information that tells me to write some code, I'm just gonna write that down and get it out of the way. And essentially, I mean, you'll see me start solving problems from this point a lot, you know, where we have a function head written with the, the name and the input, and then some, you know, sort of emptied or neutral 
start starting point uh, variable and returning that variable. Not this is not always the case, but you know often is, and this is often indicative of a uh, accumulator pattern. We're taking in a list, and we're going to be going through that list and doing stuff with it. So uh, we've got a dictionary here that we want to return. Um, then we have some test data and an expectation and the invocation of the function for our actual test that uh, where we're applying the function to the test data and then expecting this certain result. So whatever, however we end up solving this problem, you know, given this list, it better produce this dictionary. So, um, you know, our material is, is sort of centered around this idea to give you these sort of prompts to help you start thinking about problems in this way. But as you, as you read through something, um, anytime you think, okay, well, I know what to do when it says that, then just write it down, you know, as you go. Cool, all right. So let's just read through this again. Uh, so the keys are going to describe the upper and lower 50th percentile, the medium as a range, that's our keys here. Uh, this is what they mean as being described as in a, as a range, uh, like less than or equal to 0 0.5. And the values are lists containing numbers from the input that fall within the lower inclusive or upper also inclusive percentile uh, described by the key. No, no. I'm gonna hide this a little bit. <laughs> it's gonna give it away. Uh, so step one, we need to identify the median. You've done this before. Uh, using our example list, how would you in plain words identify the median? So the median, if you recall, is the middlest value. It's the, the value that, uh, lies in the middle of the data set. So we can kind of cheat. And if we order the numbers in the list from least to greatest or greatest to, to least, uh, the median is literally the, the, uh, the value in the dead center of the list. So if you have, um, if you have five numbers, one, two, three, four, five, three is the median. Um, if you have six numbers, well, I don't have that many fingers, six numbers, then you have to take the middle two values and take the mean of those. So the mean will be um, uh, three and four. So three plus four, is seven divided by two is 3.5. So we have to do something a little bit different based on whether we have a, a, an even or an odd length list. So let's write a function that'll do the work of taking a median for us, right? We could do the median in here. We could say if len list uh, mod two equals zero, then it's an even list, right? But we should probably do this. This is logic that can really stand on its own in a median function. And it'd be nice to, to have a function that'll give us the median of a collection so we don't have to write the whole thing every single time, right? So uh, we'll say def median. Uh, median takes in a list. And I'm just gonna pass here for now. Uh, same sort of thing here. Uh, as I write this, I want to I want to uh, develop a test. So how can I do think about how how I can test this, how I can test this median function? Well, I've got this list here, and I might as well just use this test list, right? So I could I'll just comment out my percentile fifty function for now because we're gonna come back to that. And we'll test median. So what should my median give me back? Um, and 
you know, you could go through here and parse this by eye, but it's so much easier to print sorted my list. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's taking a while there. Okay, so here's the sorted version of the list. And now from this, we can count uh, zero or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, uh, 11. So there are 11 entries in this. So uh, if I count five in either direction, the next number will be the median. So let's do from the right here one, two, three, four, five. So nine is the median. So that's nice and simple. So I know that for this, oops, for this, um, I'm just gonna do this, just in case I wanna reference this sorted list later. So we know that nine is our expectation given this list. That makes that nice and easy. Okay. Um, we also have, remember, we have to do something slightly different. This is an odd number and I'm, I'm already up here, I'm writing the even case, but I also have an odd case. So this is the odd case. So let's try it uh, again with slightly different data. We'll try it with an even, uh, number of elements here. So if I add um, 1000, we'll just add 1000 here. Um, that'll be easy because this will just go right here. And then that makes my median, it pulls it one to the right. Uh, since we have even even length list here, uh, we're going to do the average of uh, nine and ten, which is nine plus ten is um, nineteen, so it's nine point five. So this should be nine point five. Okay, so therefore if i when i run this function and i see 9 and then 9.5 i know it's going to be working if i thought about my tests correctly that is which you know hopefully you do okay cool so think about this how would we write this median function feel free to ask any questions you, you might have along the way uh, i'm willing to stop and take questions as we go so um, I'm actually going to do, I'm going to do the odd case first, just because it's a little easier. Uh, we'll say if lin list mod two equals one, then we'll return um, the number in the middle. So how are we going to return the number in the middle? We need the uh, len of the list, which we're already doing up here. So since I see the same function call here twice, I can save the computer of, of doing this work more than once. And I, uh, I'll just call this uh, I'll call it length. And we'll just do that. And we'll just use that length variable from now on. That way we don't have to run that function every time. Okay, so um, we'll need the length of the list and we'll need the sorted list. And I don't think we need, yeah, we won't even need the original list inside the function. We're not gonna mutate the list globally, but uh, I'm just gonna say list equals sorted list because all that really matters is the sorted form of the list. Okay, so uh, length and list are what we what we have here. So uh, how can I access the middle value in list given that list 
is uh, an odd length. We know it's an odd length because the code in this, under this uh, channel of the condition is gonna be for odd length list. We'll get to this. Okay, so um, I can use, I can index into this at whatever the index of length over two is kind of. Um, remember if I use a single slash to divide, I'm going to get a float, even if the number is evenly divisible. In this case, um, it's not because it's an odd length list. So we can actually just truncate the value and we can say uh, int. I'm just gonna cast that as an int. You do floor divide too, but this is what I like to do. So that's what I'm gonna do. Okay. So if int length over two, or we'll return uh, list sub uh, int length over two. So let's see if that passes our odd case. Nine. And that's what we expected for our odd case. So that looks like it's passing. Great. So um, so how can we use this to do our our even length here, right? So let's just see what this returns for our even length list. So I wanna see which index this is gonna give me, if it's gonna give me the nine or the 10. I think it's gonna give me the 10. Yeah, that's gonna give me the 10. So that means if it gave me the nine, I know that the other index would need to be one more than this, but since it gave me the 10, I know that the other index uh, for the nine is going to be int of the length of the list over two uh, minus one, right? So these are gonna be my two, the two points that I'll use for the mean. And we just take the average of these two. So what we do is just um, add these together. How should I do this? Let me just make this into a more discrete step. So let's call this lower, lower and upper. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so lower is the minus one and then upper is the not minus one. And then this hopefully this will clean it up a little bit. It'll be lower plus upper over two. And then that's our, that's our median for a, an even length list. Cool. All right, so there's our median. And then you can see this solution, I, I wanted to kind of show the more broken down solution where I'm breaking things into variables before we looked at this. This is the same code, um, but they're doing most of those steps like in line rather than breaking things out into variables. So you can reference that, that's in the material. Uh, I'll just delete that for now. Okay, so now that we know how to calculate the median, what does our dictionary that we want to accumulate look like? Well, we already kind of determined that part because um, we had, oh yeah, I, I had the uh, dictionary provided in that test. 
from before. Uh, this is starting to look messy. I'm just going to clean that up. We'll do that. And so since I have two cases for median, we might as well just carry that through for the percentile 50 dictionary. Oops, okay. So we know what our dictionary should look like. So we need to identify how each object in the list compares to the median. Um, so we know how to categorize it, right? So I, I would prefer actually to think about this from the for loop first, uh, rather than the control flow first. So the reason is I'm looking I'm looking at this problem statement, write a function called percentile 50 that takes a list of arbitrary numbers. Uh, the function will return a dictionary. The keys are the ranges that describe upper and lower, above or below the median. And the values are the lists of numbers from the input list that fall within the lower and upper boundaries. So I read this and I think, ah, oh, we're going through a list and we're sorting the elements of that list into categories based on some rubric. In this case, the rubric is whether they're above or below or equal to the median. Excuse me, I got hiccups. Excuse me. Um, so we're sorting things into categories. So I think, oh, okay, go through the list, sort every element in the list in a loop. So I think about the loop first, that go through the list part. So let's just get the same sort of deal. As soon as we think of it, let's just write it down. So go through the list. How do you go through the list? Uh, it's four L in list. Easy. Um, these are all numbers. So let's be a little more specific. I'll call it num. And then we'll say if the number is uh, greater than or equal to the median. And now I could make a call to median list right here. But I know I'm going to use this twice because I have two conditions here. Um, so I'm just going to say med equals median list. That way we only have to run it once. Uh, so if it's that, then um, so if it's greater than or equal to the median, then we want to put it in this key in the dictionary. So I'll say d sub string greater equal zero dot five zero. Uh, you can also just, I mean, there's nothing morally wrong with just, <laughs> some people would disagree with me. There's nothing morally wrong with just copying that like that. Oof, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna change these to double quotes. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is that list. Now think about this part. Now I could write this other, take note here, I could write this other condition and I've seen people do this where they're like, uh, I'll just write this condition because I'm thinking about it. And I mean, granted that is what I've been saying as soon as you think about it. But um, if, you're, if you're writing code like this, I mean, fair enough, I guess, put a pass here though. Um, if you don't put the pass, you don't, you're working on, invalid code at the moment and you won't be able to run it and test it. So really my goal is just to just get one of these working and then extend that working logic because I know it's going to be similar for the other one. I'm, I'm building categories. So the, the logic to determine wh whether a number belongs in a certain category and what to do, how to actually put it into that category um, 
so the the condition and the and the uh, uh, consequent the logic is going to be the same just with some slightly different details like less than instead of greater than or it's going to be a different key name right so I know it's going to be similar logic so my preference is to write it once and then once I have working logic copy it out as many times as I need and then just fill in the details so solve the problem in one place and then copy it out and just treat it like a form and change the necessary details for each one of the other conditions. Uh, you can even test it step by step along the way, but we'll just test it with this first one and then we'll go on to the next. Um, actually, I wanna do less than first. Why? No reason. Okay, so think about this. What do we want to do? I'm gonna leave this, I'm gonna, I'll leave it to you. What's my next slide in code here? What do, what do I need to do from here? Put it in Slack. Triple question marks, fair enough. It's always good to, to name those known unknowns. Just trying to get. <laughs> It's all good. Um, just trying to see uh, a few more answers here, but I guess we kind of got a small class today. That'll do. Um, so we can append. So remember what we want to end up with. This is this is why this line is so useful because you get to this point and you're like, wait, what am I doing? I don't know. May, maybe you're not, but you know, honestly, I'll I'll get halfway through a problem and I'll be like, okay. I've achieved the thing I was trying to do. And now that I'm here, what do I need to do? And it's nice to have an expectation already written because it reminds you, right? Well, whatever I end up doing, I better end up with a list of numbers as the values. So I've determined where this number should go and its location. Now I need to put it in there. Okay, so the question is how do I put it in there? That involves understanding, you know, what does that mean? Do I do I add it to a to a sum? Am I uh, adding it to a to a list or a set or a tuple or is it a string? I, I don't know. In this case, they are of course lists. The way we add things into a list is with dot append. And I've had a few people look at this kind of code, and I want you to remember this particular code, right? This is I'm going to just. I'm just going to say this is uh, important with a with a big wink there. Uh, this is useful. This will be useful later because um, this is helping you understand how to what's really going on, not with not just with dictionaries, but with like the way things, uh, the way uh, expressions evaluate in Python, right? If I asked you for an example, line 26 here, what I have highlighted, if I printed the type, if I printed the type of that, what would you think would be printed off? Any dissenting opinions? Cool, yeah, it will be a list.
but I, I've seen people say, oh, well, that's a list. And then it's, it's kind of weird to append to it because it still feels like a dictionary. And then they'll say like, well, I didn't know you could append to dictionaries. And you can't append to dictionaries. Dictionaries do not have the method append, uh, but you can append a list. So it's, for some of you, this may just come very naturally and make sense. And that's great. And it seems like a few people have given that answer and you know, it seems like it's landing well. And that's great, but uh, for for some, it's kind of different to look at this and think, well, that's a list when it looks like a dictionary. So um, when you're when you're asking when you're using a key to specify a location in the dictionary, like we're doing here, the value of that expression is the value at that location in the dictionary, which is a list, and we'll append to it. Okay, cool. Diatribe complete. Cool. So I have these values in my less than key. So let's see if that's accurate. So I've got 15850.1 and 9, and I expected to have 1585, 1585. 0 0.1 and 9. So that looks like it's matching. Great. That tells me I have working logic. I know the next one's going to be similar. So like I said, my preference at this point is to just copy it and change whatever I need to. So let's see if that does it. Voila. So uh, notice amongst my two tests that the um, lower bounds are the same, but there's a difference in the upper bound. Um, the test with an even length list does not include nine and it does include a thousand. Obviously it would include a thousand because that's what I added, but it doesn't include nine in the upper uh, half because um, nine is not the median of this list like it is in the other one. So, you know, something to think about. It's really for that one. And this one should be. All right, so we we skipped ahead through these slides a lot, but let's see what they have to say for themselves. So this is going through the control flow first. Um, but I hope I, I sort of made I hope I made my case for you know going through the the for loop first. Um, and if you're not totally sold, if you're not if if you you're thinking, well, maybe I would do control flow first, or maybe I would do the for loop first. I mean, look at this code. It's fundamentally incomplete because it's saying if num greater than med, where is num? In my code, num is right here from the for loop, right? So this is this condition is um, sort of begging the question, as it were, for the for the for for loop. It's implying there's there's a num to be gotten so um you know and I, I don't so much uh, this isn't you know so much me like criticizing the material but more more to get you all to think about like you know what's the sort of the next most obvious easy step that you can take as you're coding because i see i it's worth it to me to mention that because i see a lot of people uh, sort of not doing that and then trying to hold a lot of information in their minds at once so that they can conceive of a fully uh, working solution before they implement it. And I think I understand where that's coming from, but often when, when you're trying to get code produced uh, quickly and efficiently, 
it's better to just jump in and be like, okay, what's my mo next most obvious thing, next most obvious thing. And a lot of problems just fall apart just by, just with that alone. Um, you know, you'll take something that's pretty hard to, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I've, I've solved this a number of times before, but you know, this is a few lines of code here. If I'm trying to like brain this all out first time, um, it's a bit of information to hold in your mind, you know? So just jump in, don't be afraid to start putting code down. Uh, worst thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna get an error. And if you learn how to read errors, then it's kind of Python trying to do uh, the hard part of your job for you, the part of your job that you don't wanna do, which is code validation and like, you know, uh, I don't know, the, the weird stuff that the computer is good at. You're going to offload that task onto Python. Well, if I get an error, well, it's just going to do the thing that I didn't want to think about. And I'm going to get to think about, spend more of my time on the thing that I did want to think about, which is whatever it is that I'm trying to get the code to do in the first place. So yeah, that's, don't be afraid of that, like kind of methodical, uh, small steps solution. Uh, Cause it, never really let me down so anywho put it all together um so this is our yeah they're taking the median um they got the dictionary actually that is kind of a better practice uh to have that flipped not a big deal but often um with an accumulator pattern you'll have the accumulator target like right above the for loop. And then this would be a, a constant throughout the function, right? So the median isn't gonna change. So a lot, a lot of times you'll put your constants and maybe other variables that you'll use at the top and then you'll put your accumulator or accumulators immediately above the for, the for loop, but not really that, not a huge deal, but it's gonna work either way, obviously. So this code I think is essentially identical. Okay, next one. Oh, this next one is going to, right, this next one uses that. Okay. All right. Ah, I'm just going to copy it out. Mm, I'll do it here. Okay. Modifying what we've already built. Uh, let's try this again, but instead of 50th percent off, let's cut the data into quartiles and do the same thing. Let's make a function that takes in a list of random numbers, could be floats or ints, and returns a dictionary, which I, whoa, whoa, excuse me, and returns a dictionary, which identifies where the numbers appear in terms of the quartiles. Uh, assume each quartile mark includes the lower end and the upper, the lower end of the range and goes up to, but does not include the upper end of the range. So we're assuming sort of Python's default assumption for upper and lower boundaries, which is that the lower is included and the upper is not included. Okay. So step one, we need to identify the quartiles using our example list. How would you in plain words identify the quartiles? So think about this for a second. Oops, I'll hide that code. So, okay. <laughs> cool. 
go Python, tell me what's wrong so I can fix it. Yeah, exactly. That's the, cause it's gonna tell you the stuff that, you know, it's good at finding and, and it's harder for you to find, so here we go. Get your halves and then get the halves of those halves. Yep, exactly. Let's look at this code. So we'll uh, we'll have our list. Let's do the original one. My list here, uh, and I'll say list. So list median, and where am I using this? Let's call that med again. It is median list. And the, oh, right, yeah. So this is the whole dictionary, our 50th percentile, per, per, percentile 50 dictionary. Um, and then this is the boundary essentially for uh, zero to 25th, the range from zero to the 25th percentile. And then this is the boundary from uh, 0 0.5 from, uh, from the median, excuse me, to the, um, Uh, to the top, all the way to the top. <laughs> cool. Or excuse me, from the median to the 75th uh, percentile. Okay. So I'm just thinking, what does it want us to call this? Uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to call it what I want to call it. I'm going to call this What should I call it? Uh, quartiles D. This will take in list. Like I said, I'll change this to list. Okay. And then we need our, I'm gonna, instead of calling this list 25th, I'm gonna call this um, Q1, no, hmm, hmm. I'm gonna just call it lower and upper. We'll just do that. And then this, we can call, ah, that's a good name for now, whatever, not that big a deal. And we'll put med there because, I don't know, low, med, and upper, why not? Okay, so here's our dictionary again. Here's our accumulator target. And we're gonna return that. And let's get a test up and running. In this case, I'm expecting something similar to the previous one. Uh, I'm not gonna go through and write out the, the whole dictionary, but I, I already have an idea of what to expect, which is, I think fine for most dictionaries. Uh, you don't need to be, sometimes it can be pretty arduous to be really specific. So get a, get a sense of what should the keys look like? What should the values look like? And that's usually good. Okay, so we'll print quartiles D of my list. 
And we know that we expect a dictionary out of that. Okay, so let's get our starter dictionary here. Cool. Oh, I'm getting some other things. Let me comment these out. Okay, so now identify how each object in the list compares to the median, so on and so forth. Okay, so uh, same sort of thing. We wanna go through the list and get an instance of the number. So for num in list, just prove that we did that, there's our number. And then from here, I can say, um, now let's just get one of these quartiles working, get working logic, and then extend that working logic to the other one. So we'll say if num less than zero, oh, not zero, we'll do this. If num less than lower, um, that'll be this first key. And we'll say D sub dot append num. Let's check that out. Okay, so this is what it's saying is in our first quartile. I'm gonna assume it's gonna give us a test at the end that we can go off of. Um, cool, but that looks right to me. Um, we could actually, did I, I did delete that. So let me just real quick here. I'll print sorted my list real quick. Okay. And then we can verify this. I do, <laughs> I'm compelled to verify this. Uh, one and 1.0 should be our numbers. So uh, I know that nine is the median here. I know that our upper boundaries aren't included. So nine won't actually be included in the, the second quartile to be included in the, the third. So um, of here, of, of this portion, uh, or is it, no, it's this portion. Yeah, so that's our lower half, right? So of this portion, we should have one, two, three, four, five. So this will be our median again. Uh, and since that's the upper bound is not included, right? Uh, the two left are 0 0.1 and one. And it comes out in a different order, but that's the same content. So that's what's important in this case. Cool. So that's, it's always good to verify if you can. Okay, so that seems like that's good logic. And from here, um, I think we can just say, now see, this is a good example. Um, a, a number, if I have this number 0 0.1, for example, uh, number would be less than lower, it'd be less than med, it'd be less than upper, and it'd be less than whatever the end is. In this case, we'll just do an else. Um, so this is a good example. If it's if it's less than this first one, it's actually gonna be less than all the rest of them. So I only wanted to add it to the first one. So in that case, uh, in this case, I'll just have elifs. I'll change chain these together. And then on the final one, if it's not less than any of the other ones, uh, I'll just put it in the last one. So now I just gotta go change these.
Okay, less than equal 1.0, less than equal 1.0. I'm just gonna check my highlighting here. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Good. Okay, cool. Let's see if I did it right. Okay. One and zero point one. 585, 44, 9, and 10, 234, 64, and 746. Okay. Kind of skim through these steps here. Same deal, doing the appending. Looks good. Well, we don't have a test. That's okay. This code looks uh, essentially identical to mine. Yeah, I don't see a difference other than some different variable naming and stuff. We got a question, why do the values not include the quartile below them. So like if I have this number one, for example, why doesn't one show up in all of the lists? Is that your question? Cool. So if I, if these were ifs, just ifs, they would, but since they're elifs, what this means is that as soon, so Python's gonna, you know, it, like you and I, it starts at the top of the document and uh, goes down. It starts from the top to the bottom. So it's gonna start checking the conditions at the top before the conditions at the bottom. So as soon as it encounters a condition that's true in a system of, of if, elif, else, Right, and with as many elifs in between, as soon as it encounters one of those conditions that's true, it doesn't check any of the other ones below it. It's just, it's finished, right? It's so, uh, let's say this five or the eight, let's say we're checking the eight. So Python's gonna plug in eight for num and it's gonna say uh, num less than lower, lower is, what, what was, oh, lower is five. Uh, uh, eight less than five is false. Eight less than nine is true, because med was nine. So since this is true, it's gonna run this code. And since that condition was true, we'll say true, we'll say checked and true, we'll say checked and false. And then since the previous one was true, not checked, not checked. Does that make sense? So as soon as it encounters a true condition, it doesn't even bother checking the other ones when they're when they're bound together in, in, a, in a system of if, elifs, and else. Cool. The dictionary keys are a bit misleading. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, all right. Seems like everybody's good. I'm gonna say everybody's good. Okay, cool. We're about at the halfway point here. Uh, let's take a little, little recess. Uh, I'll say we can reconvene at 
um, two minutes after the hour. Cool. Let me pull up my Slack on my phone here. There we go. All right. All right, so our next one, let's get started on this. Oops, we got, uh, that'll do. Okay, so create a function that takes in a number, we'll flip a coin, heads or tails and return the count of times the coin flipped heads and tails, as well as a list of what the flips were. Okay, so presumably the number will tell us how many times to flip the coin. Okay, so create a function, let's call it coin flipper. Um, I'm gonna start with the test as usual. So coin flipper will take in a number, we'll say four, uh, and it will return, write a function that takes in a number, we'll flip a coin, we'll say flip a coin, in quotes, uh, heads or tails, return the count of times the coin flipped heads and tails. Okay, so it'll be num heads, num tails, and then a list. So this is gonna use randomness to determine um, what exactly the result of each of these flips are. So I can't know exactly with this test, but I can get an idea, right? So let's say, uh, I mean, the amount of heads and the amount of tails should add up to four. So we'll say we got three heads and four tails. Oh, like I said, <laughs> yeah, heads and, and one tail. Uh, and we'll say we got heads, tails, heads, heads. So that's three heads and one tails. Okay, cool. So uh, obviously, you know, our results are very likely to not be exactly this, but it, this gives us an idea of what it's to return. So let's say, um, oh, oh, okay. This will be a dictionary. I didn't. I'm gonna rewrite this prompt. That's not very clear. <laughs> okay, so our dictionary is gonna be like, like this. It'll be this dictionary followed by the list. Oops. And we'll say three and one. Okay, that's better. Good. 
So think about where you would start that dictionary. How would how would we start this dictionary off? I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, And then we'll return D and flips list. Okay. So um, in this case, I'm just going to start these at zero since that seems like a rational place to start them. Cool. So since both of these are empty, I'm going to assume both of these are going to be accumulators in our in our uh, system here. Um, so num represents the number of times that I want to flip the coin. Whenever you have an integer and you say, I want to do x, y, z as many times as whatever this integer is, you can write a for loop through a range of that integer. So I can say for uh, underscore, underscore doesn't do anything fancy. It's just a valid name. It's just a name, a variable name like I or num or whatever. But it, it's it's a declaration for yourself and for others reading your code that you're not going to use this. So we'll say for underscore in range uh, num. Cool. So this is just going to repeat a process num times. Nice and convenient. Okay, so now I just need to to make the flip, and I need to uh, discern whether that flip should be in heads or tails. Cool. So for now, I'll just put a pass here. So the the big question is, how do I make that flip? Because it has to be a random flip. Fortunately, we don't, we don't have to build like a whole randomness engine, could you imagine? Um, some of you perhaps could imagine what that would entail. Oops, come on. All right, Zoom is taking over my screen. We'll just wait for that. That's an excellent, excellent design, Zoom. Okay. Nope. Okay, <laughs> let's see if I can use my keyboard. All right, finally. So we have a few options. We need to, Python has a library, a whole library dedicated to the task called random, called the random library. So uh, I want to import the library. So I'll just say import random. So random, the random library is built into uh, the Python standard library. So it's, it's part of any complete, uh, implementation of a Python specification will include uh, an implementation of the random library, to my knowledge. Um, so, but it's not in scope, meaning it's not, it's not brought into what Python, the tools that Python is aware of by default. So uh, the tools that, yeah, it's not in, brought in by default. So we have to explicitly tell Python to bring this in. So we'll use import. We'll say import random. We have a few choices here. <clears throat> uh, we have random.choice. I'll just copy these in. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It just keeps, I keep clicking on it and it keeps looking up the word. That's, we're looking up the word again. Okay. Every single time. Oh my gosh. I can't make it not bring up the dictionary. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, Apple, please. This is just uh, an exercise in me trying to do, watching me try to do basic tasks on the computer. All like, like the only competent computer skill that I have is programming aside from just clicking and, you know, moving my cursor around. That's the real challenge for me at least. So we all have our strengths and weaknesses, I suppose. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> I finally did it. So random nut choice. 
random.randent and random.random. Uh, these will all work a little bit differently. And there, there are a mul kind of a multitude of tools in the random library. Let's see. Let's just come into IPython real quick. Start an IPython session. Do a little investigative programming. We'll say um, deer, excuse me, import. I have to import it first. Let's just look at the random library a little bit. I'll say deer random. Just pass it in like that. And this is going to give me a list of all the methods included in the random library. You can see there's a few, right? So these are not the only ones. These are not the only tools available in random. Um, these are suited for the task that we're going to do. Um, but there are a lot of, yeah, there's a lot. Randomness is a whole big can of worms all by itself. So there's, you know, we've got beta variate and choices, which is sort of like a multiple choice thing and uh, expo variate, gamma variate, uh, Gauss, all the, all the tools that you'd ever want for all your randomness needs. Should you want to look through that at some point, it's there. Okay, so we've got random dot choice. So choice takes in a sequence, what it calls a sequence, and returns a choice fairly. So it chooses between the elements given fairly. So um, the way I would use choice is, uh, Maybe I can't choose between an apple and a banana. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was going to say, maybe I, I, uh, I can't choose between an apple and a banana. And I want to write a program that'll choose for me. I, I literally did this. I, I couldn't choose between, what was it? Uh, ramen and Thai food. So I made choice choose for me. It chose ramen. Uh, so choice is just going to choose one of the things that you give it an option to choose from. And it'll, there's no way to like weigh one option more heavily than the other, other than to just include it uh, more often, which you can do if you wanted to do that. So this has um, a two out of three chance to choose apple and a one out of three chance to choose banana. Uh, randint, this is kind of like range. In fact, you can use you can use choice with range. It'll choose from a range. Oops. So like if I did range 10, so a choice of range 10, random choice of range 10 will choose a random number between zero and nine. Uh, if I say random 10, I think it'll choose a random number between 1 and 10. So it's a little different, but it's a similar kind of idea to range. Um, I think, can you do, can I do 5 and 10 like this? Yeah, but it's a little, it's a little different because this upper bound is included, which it's not in, uh, in range. Uh, and then random.random .random doesn't take any arguments. It just returns a float between zero and one, just a random point on the on the continuum of floats between zero and one. Um, yeah, so shoot, we could we could just uh, print all these out to see what they do. Well, it looks like we got a couple questions here. Not expo variate said evaporate. Yep, that actually just makes your uh, CPU uh, just effervesce and then you got to get a new computer. <laughs> uh, 
I okay. I admit if my partner ever hears this that I've used random dot choice to choose what she should eat at times. It's happened. It's a very useful, uh, very useful built-in function. Uh, if all the options are, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. You know, I'm having fun. That's good. Um, all right. So name random is not defined. Yes, of course. Because I, I, well, this is the error you get when you don't import random um, or don't import it correctly. Who wants to fix my code? <laughs> Who wants to tell me what I did wrong? Anybody? Hmm, that's a thought. Uh, let's try it. Let's try that. Calling random before I imported it. Indeed, yep. You gotta import it before you use it. There you go. Silly mistake. Um, somebody suggested this from random import choice or random or whatever. You can do this if there's one specific tool that you want. You're like, I don't need to import, I don't need to bring the whole library into scope. I just want this one specific thing and then it'll bring that into scope. It will need to import. I mean, technically it brings the whole library into into memory and includes it in your program because there may be other tools in that library that the function uh, that you did import will rely on. And it can't actually guarantee, you know, that that's not gonna be the case. So it'll bring the whole thing into, into scope either way or into, into memory either way. But if you only wanna bring choice into scope, uh, you can, or one, one thing from a given library, you can say from that library import and then just the one thing that you want to bring in. Um, it changes how you use the, the, uh, it changes what you have to write when you invoke the, the function or the tool from that, that library. So real quick here, let's just run this and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second here. So random is now defined. Okay, cool. So now we have running code. So uh, choice chose uh, between a range, choice chose from a range from zero to 10 and chose eight. Um, Random.randint chose a number between five and 10. So notice it's similar to range, but it, this is actually a great example because it chose 10, right? Range, if this was like range, 10 would not be included. So I forget if, Randint includes, I think Randint includes both of its boundaries. So uh, random.randint between five and 10 will possibly choose five or possibly choose 10. I, I believe that's the case. You can run it and I don't know, find out or look at the help docs. Uh, I don't use Randint that much. So I don't know off the top of my head. And then random.random didn't need to do anything to it, just gave us a float like this. Cool. Uh, let's just talk about that real quick. Let's say I didn't do uh, import random like this. And this is your, well, your choice. I mean, you can pick whichever one you want, whichever one do you think suits your needs better. Uh, in general though, for the sake of simplicity, when, when, you're, when you're learning, don't worry about the syntax really. The, the from library import uh, or from module import tool, syntax just I would just recommend especially for now like when you're learning if you're learning if this is new information to you just import the whole library 
and then name the library dot method name uh, for now. Feel free to disregard that too if you want to <laughs> want to do your own thing. You know, I'm not here to tell you how to learn, just to help you learn. Okay, so if we oops, if we do this. This gets a, a really weird one. We get an attribution error and we're gonna get it on choice here. Let's paste in this error. So attribution error, built-in function or method has no uh, attribute choice. So it sees random not as an imported model module, but a built-in function, uh, built-in um, uh, method, oh, Let me actually do this. I'm like, wait a second, that's not quite the error we should be getting. Oh, gosh. Okay, I'm like invalid syntax, that's not the error we should be getting either. But I have this that whole text right there. Okay, name error, <laughs> finally. That's what, that's what we should be getting. Okay, random is not defined. And you think, well, why not? You know, I imported it, but if you, if you do this, uh, you just use the method name or the function name just as it is. So you don't put the, the module name in front of it and say dot tool name or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm like not commenting out the this random text that I'm just placing in everywhere. Okay, cool. So this will work like that. I'm gonna do just import random though. We'll go from there. I'm just gonna leave all that up there. Y'all can reference it if you update your GitHub or you go look on GitHub, you can look at my code and see all this, all these notes, okay. Okay, import choice, excuse me, import random. And I'm gonna use choice. So let's say flip, flop, flip equals random dot choice. And we'll choose from H or T. And then I'll say, um, Um, if flip equals h list dot append flip else uh, list dot append flip. You know what? I'm appending flip either way. I don't need to append it there. I don't know what I'm doing, uh, but I will count. Uh, in the dictionary. So I'll, I'll append it right away. And I'll, I'll just increment the count. So I'll say D sub heads uh, plus equals one. Now remember D sub heads is an integer as is tails. So I'll, I'll just add one respectively to the appropriate key. Heads and tails, bingo. Mm. What did I do? Oh, I called it list, didn't I? Because that's what I always do. I'm going to call it list. OK, so I got two heads, two tails, heads, tails, tails, heads. So that, that's not exactly what I wrote down, but obviously I couldn't anticipate what random was gonna do, otherwise it wouldn't be random. So that at least matches the pattern. I get heads and a number, tails and a number. The sum of those is equal to the number that I passed in, which is four. 
and I get four heads or tails um, in the list. Good. Yep, they're going to use random.random. Let's just jump to the code. OK, a couple of small differences here, basically the same. Um, you got your dictionary and your list. Uh, flip equals random.random. And then you check if flip is less than or equal to 0 0.5. And since random.random gives you a float between 0 and 1, if it's less than half, if it's less than 0 0.5, then we'll do one thing. And if it's more, then we'll do the other. Uh, in this case, they could have used random.random .random right in the condition here and then not even used uh, flip since they're also appending uh, T and H in different spots. But I just had it choose from T or H because I don't know, I like that. I like choice. That's my favorite of the of the three. But feel free to play around with all of them and you know use whichever one. Cool. So let's write a function that will return the probability that we get all heads exactly k times out of n flips. Uh, this is a preview for what you'll be going over tomorrow with the binomial distribution. We're getting into the good stuff. All right, so we actually don't even need our coin flipper for this one. Uh, well, I guess I won't hurt to just leave it there, whatever. I'll uh, return the probability to that. Okay, so this is our binomial PMF formula. Some of you may have encountered this, or you probably all have encountered this in the material at this point, I think. Uh, perhaps not, though. If not, that's fine. We're going to go over it together. So um, what this is saying is the probability that X, which is our particular case or our event, right? That some, some event equals, okay, that our trial, our particular trial equals, uh, uh, gives us a result of k. Uh, in this case, it's like asking, since this is binomial, it's like asking, you know, if I, if given that I flip a coin, which has a probability of success of 0 0.5, um, success is an arbitrary uh, case, um, you think about it as a probability of success, although, I mean, is it a success to get a heads or a su success to get a tails? Um, there's a connotation there that, that we try to ignore um, when we're talking about success in the, in the sense of uh, binomial distribution. So the unconnotated success, right? Well, we'll just say heads or tails. Uh, we'll just say heads for now, why not? So if I flip a coin 10 times, what's the probability uh, given that I have a probability of getting a heads of 50-50, what's the probability that I, how would I calculate the probability that I would get exactly um, nine heads? Doesn't matter the order, it just uh, matters the, uh, that I get exactly nine. So, so what's the probability that my trial of this, which is X, yields k successes, which is 9. Given that n is 10, that's our number of flips, and p is the probability of success, which is, again, just an arbitrary case. Uh, the binomial PMF deals with ev events, discrete events that have one of two possible states, and it, which it calls success or failure. If you wanted to think about that as a, as a Boolean value, I guess you could. Um, we won't be making any like direct analogy as such, but uh, yeah, just uh, any event that can can have two states, true or false, heads or tails, success or failure, or whatever. Um, that kind of event is called a Bernoulli trial. 
Um, and Bernoulli is actually its own distribution as well. Uh, Bernoulli always, always is only um, describing a single event that has one of two outcomes. Binomial is a distribution of Bernoulli trials. So cool. So what, what this is saying is the probability that our trial ends up with K successes is equal to the combinations of uh, n choose k times p to the power k times one minus the probability to the power n minus k. n is our number of trials minus our intended number of successes. Excuse me, sorry. Um, my roommate's doing a project uh, the next door, the fire alarm. Yeah, the cookies, exactly. You can hear it. Ah, okay, they've got it handled. It's all good. Uh, I think they've got the cookie fire out. Okay, so let's actually implement this. So notice we've got these, these tall parentheses here. This is, if you're not familiar, this is uh, uh, combinations. Often we'll say in choose K. Oops. So the to write the combinations formula, let's kind of work backwards here. Um, sorry, I, I've I've stepped ahead briefly. Let let's work backwards because I'm always talking about I'm always talking about working from your goal back back towards your your process, right? Your how are you going to implement that goal? So let's just um, Start with a question. Uh, if I uh, flip a coin um, 10 times, I'll just use the one I had 10 times, um, what's the probability of getting uh, nine? Uh, heads. And we'll just be explicit about this. Um, since it's a coin, we usually talk about a coin flip as being as, uh, uh, as a way of talking about an event that has a 50-50 probability. So since it's a coin, we'll say uh, P equals uh, 0 0.5. Um, I'm flipping it 10 times. So N equals 10. So n is our number of trials. This is kind of funny. Why don't we do this? Ah. Coin. Uh, n is our number of trials. And then k is our number of successes. Um, what is the probability of getting nine heads? Nine is our k. And then our success case. Oh my gosh. Success case equals heads. All right. And I'm just, I'm writing this down just so we can keep track of it, right? This is, take note, uh, an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary decision. And we notice that we don't need to know when we're implementing the math, right? The formula doesn't include the success case. There is not a variable to, to hold one case versus the other case. That's not represented. All we need to know is the probability of, of, of uh, an event resulting in that success case, probability of a success, the number of trials, and the number of successes that we're curious about calculating for. Okay, so let's implement this. Um, so I'm going to print my binomial PMF, which is the function that we're about to write. Of uh, and it'll take in. It needs to take in uh, n k and p here. I'll do this. 
Number of trials is 10. You know what? My notes are just Python at this point, so I can just uncomment my notes. So often I'm like, I'm gonna write pseudocode and then I I'm like, oh, this is just code and I just uncommented it and it runs because my, my pseudocode is just Python at this point. Uh, so that's kind of the really great thing about Python. Like what, when I'm learning C, I, I like C and C++, you're supposed to like pseudocode everything in comments like in alongside your code and I'm just like, oh, I'll just write it in Python because why not? Okay, anyways. Um, yeah. So here's our binomial PMF. So let's define that def PMF. We'll take an N, K, and P. I'm going to default P to 0 0.5. We don't have to do that, but I don't know. I usually do that, so whatever. So I need to, with this, I need to return combinations um, in choose K. I feel like I spelled this wrong. Combinations, okay, in choose K. But I haven't written that yet. So I need to def combinations takes in n and k and returns. And that brings us to where we are. OK. This is our question. Um, this is our combinations algorithm. It's in factorial, or I'm going to say factorial n over factorial k times n minus k factorial. So in order to write combinations, I have to write factorial. Um, say factorial n. So we'll say def factorial. For a num in range. 1 to n plus 1, prod times equals 1. Nope, I don't keep doing that. Uh, prod times equals num, and then return prod. OK. So factorial, and let's just verify it, make sure I didn't make some silly mistake. Factorial 4. That'll be 24. Uh, actually, it'll be up here. Yeah, 24. Oops. Let me comment out this up there. OK, good. I guess I didn't need to comment. I didn't even need to comment those out. Great, okay. Cool, so we get that 24. That's good, factorials working well. So let's complete uh, combinations. So that's uh, factorial n over, um, we have two factorials here, so that'll be factorial factorial k times, oops, factorial n minus k. Get the difference of n and k, pass that to factorial, multiply that times factorial k, put that under factorial n, return that, okay. So uh, I've already basically got a test here. So the way I call it a binomial PMF is just gonna do my test for combinations because hey, I'm lazy, why not? N K So um, N and K, this is a little funny. N is the number of trials. 
k and you know, often this is in the context of factorial often this is called r we could think about it as r just to distinguish it from k and binomial and we'll call this r or k so um combinations in an r uh r is the group size so if i have 10 objects how many combinations of nine objects can i make um that's what's what we're asking here uh if i have 10 objects how many combinations of two objects can i make Um, if I have 10 objects, how many combinations of nine objects can I make? That'll be 10, right? It's like, because it's the same as asking how many combinations of one object can I make? Cool. Okay, cool. So we've got our combinations. So let's implement the rest of our Let's see how far we can get if, if, uh, until we need to write another function in our binomial PMF. Okay, so we've got combinations uh, in choose K um, times P to the K. And why not have some parentheses? Never hurts. Times uh, one minus P. to the n minus k. Cool, so there's our probability. So this is the probability if I flip a coin 10 times of getting exactly nine heads. All right, well, let's just walk through this. Combinations, PMF, blah, blah, blah. 